Hey guys, welcome back to Vetfolio Voice. For this episode, sponsored by Blue Rabbit Ventures, I was joined by pharmacologist Dr. Natalie Young to discuss a condition that is super common, but that I find super challenging, and that is managing UTIs when to treat, when not to treat subclinical bacteria versus UTI, and what actually constitutes clinical signs. All of these are questions that just spin around in my head when it comes to UTIs. Natalie was extremely helpful in terms of clarifying some of what we find in the ISCADE guidelines for treating UTIs. And I also appreciated her acknowledgement that some of these decisions really come down to clinical judgment and she was great at providing information to help aid our clinical judgment in any given case. Dr. Natalie Young is the pharmacist in charge of Brava's North Carolina location, a PCAB accredited sterile compounding veterinary pharmacy in Raleigh. She graduated from the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics before receiving her chemistry degree from UNC Chapel Hill in 2006. She went on to earn her doctorate from the UNC Chapel Hill Eshelman School of Pharmacy in 2016. Upon graduation, she jumped headfirst into numerous unique opportunities to learn from experts in both compounding and veterinary pharmacology. Dr. Young is board certified through the Board of Pharmacy Specialists in Sterile Compounding. She currently serves as the chairman of the American College of Veterinary Pharmacists, the chair of the American Pharmacists Association's Compounding SIG, and the past president of the North Carolina Veterinary Medical Association's Industry Council. Dr. Young also serves in the American Pharmacists Association's House of Delegates as an assistant professor of clinical education at the UNC Chapel Hill Eshelman School of Pharmacy and as a consulting clinical staff pharmacist at several veterinary clinics. In her commitment to promote veterinary pharmacy and compounding education, she's authored many peer-reviewed scientific publications, research studies, projects, and provided numerous continuing education lectures for professionals throughout the United States. Well, for this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Natalie Young, and we're going to talk about a super important topic that I'm so glad to have you on the podcast discussing today, because like we talked about, it's super important, and I think we probably need to be talking about it a little bit more, and that is antimicrobial stewardship. So thank you so much for joining me. Yes, thank you for having me, and you're absolutely right. This is such an important topic, specifically FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine is really interested in antimicrobial stewardship, and it's a big one health issue, right? There's been a big initiative that started about five years ago in different phases where we're trying to protect um, our antibiotics that we have in our toolbox for humans and animals. So thank you for having me on. I think UTIs might be one of the best topics we can tackle with antimicrobial stewardship. Absolutely. And I'll be honest, UTIs intimidate me a little bit because when I have a patient come in for a UTI, sometimes you know we get lucky, quote unquote, and we can identify the cause and treat it and not have this come back and kind of recur. But, you know, many times it goes a different direction. So yeah, let's just jump right in. What do you say? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Okay. So sample handling to start off. Ideally, we have a patient come in, they're presenting with symptoms of a UTI and we get a sample and immediately send that off to the lab to get some testing done. But of course, you know, many times our, our lab work has already gone out for the day or it's Friday at five o'clock because that's when animals really like to get sick the most or, you know, a Saturday afternoon or something along those lines. And it's just not possible to get that sample and send it off to the lab right away. So in those situations, how would you recommend that we handle those samples in order to get the most accurate results? Yeah, that's really tough. And I had to laugh because, you know, the difficult cases always come in on Friday night or Saturday morning, right? (laughs) Always. Well, as you know, uh, cystocentesis is always preferred, but definitely not possible in most cases. If you're going to try to do a free catch, that's not preferred either. If You know, you're out in the yard behind the hospital or the clinic. Be mindful that there's a lot of bugs out in the environment and that can contaminate your sample. So really what you want, um, you want to get as clean of a sample as possible. You want to quickly put it in the refrigerator and you want to get it to the lab within 24 hours. So 
I think when you're dealing with the clock on a Friday night or a Saturday, I don't know, probably the best thing is to just start treating that patient, especially if they're painful, which is, you know, something we'll touch on in just a minute, but maybe try to get another sample on Monday morning that you can, you can get to the lab within 24 hours, because you're really, you're risking, if you go beyond those 24 hours, getting it to the lab, you're really risking getting a false negative or a false positive. So if you're going to spend the money on that, that lab test, you really want it to be as accurate as possible. And just to clarify, are we talking about a urinalysis and a culture and susceptibility or just the culture and susceptibility? So I'm just talking about the culture and susceptibility at this point. Okay. Okay. So for culture and susceptibility, we want that to be there within 24 hours. We may have a little wiggle room on our UA there, but if we really want accurate results on our UCS, we need to get that right away. Right. Right. So that kind of brings up a good question where you said, you know, maybe get another sample on Monday morning where we can send that out. You know, I guess my question would be, what what do we do in those cases if we don't have that urine culture and susceptibility? And if we do get that sample on Monday morning after we've already started treatment, what kind of implications would that have on our results? Yeah, you know, there's a there's a lot of moving parts here, right? First and foremost, to address if if you do have a patient that's painful the guidelines do say go ahead and start antimicrobial therapy rather than than holding off and awaiting your culture and susceptibility results you you want to relieve that discomfort when you're choosing what you're going to start with without a cns the guidelines say amoxicillin is really preferred and then you could also consider starting with tms or bactrim as we all call it you know you really want to be careful with Bactrim and, you know, especially our, our susceptible breeds like our Dobermans, um, making sure that they're staying either not using that drug or making sure they stay well hydrated. I prefer moxicillin. And the next question is often, all right, well, how about a moxicillin with clavulonic acid added to it? Not necessarily preferred. There's no there's no literature to support in these cases adding that second component or that it's helpful. The other thing I will add just as a little pearl is there are different formulations of your amoxicillin with your clavulonic acid. There's your clavamox, which is a certain ratio, and then your there's all different ratios within the human commercial products. So pay attention to what you're choosing because the higher the clavulonic acid component, the more diarrhea your patient could experience. So definitely recommending here just to go with the amoxicillin component. So when you are choosing your initial therapy across the board, if this is a recurrent infection, whatever drug your patient has been on in the past, it's probably a good idea to choose something different this time. You know, if it's coming back, maybe we want to take a different route this time. So then you asked me about the results coming in on on a Monday. You know, it's hard for me to say. Um, I, I'm a veterinary pharmacist and you're, you're definitely the, the expert in diagnosis and what we do from there, but, uh, and I'll defer to you for your expertise there, but Typically, I mean, if you started like on a Friday, right, if you started that antimicrobial therapy and your patient is improving, maybe you don't even need to send off for a test, right? That's going to really be up to you. And it, it's additional cost to the client, which, you know, they're never happy about if it's not warranted. Okay. So I'm, this is really interesting to hear you say, because this, this definitely mirrors what I've seen clinically of, you know, just starting treatment when we don't have the ability to get that sample to the lab, or if we don't have the ability to get a sample at all, continuing on antimicrobials if our patient is improving. And and sometimes we get clinical success with that. So I, I, it's very rare that somebody defers to me for my expertise. So I appreciate that. But certainly I would echo what you're saying from what I've seen clinically that, that, you know, sometimes we do get lucky and these just go ahead and resolve. And I think that kind of dovetails into my next question here of duration of treatment. That's one of my places that I get a little bit nervous when I don't have a culture and susceptibility, but I do have clinical improvement of, 
making sure that I'm treating long enough to resolve this infection, but not so long that I'm putting additional pressure on this bacteria and creating more resistance. So I know what the guidelines say. And I, you know, I'll be honest, the three day treatment idea scares the heck out of me. But, but what kind of recommendations do you have there as far as if, you know, especially if we are seeing clinical improvement without the additional susceptibility, what kind of duration do you feel like is typically effective? Yeah, I, I hear you. And when, and when the guidelines first came out and they, they said the working group suggested three to five days might be effective. That was a really hard pill for everyone in our profession to swallow because I feel like so often with antibiotics, no matter what we're treating, we just default to 14 days. Right. (laughs) All the time. And I don't know what you've seen in practice. Um, I haven't seen a significant number of cases where that three to five days was enough, but, you know, the guidelines do encourage us to give it, give it a try in in certain cases. I think it's totally warranted to go seven days, um, 14, if that makes you feel more comfortable. But I think seven days, just in my experience, is that sweet spot. And I think the guidelines do actually support that. (laughs) I'm doing a little happy dance over here because I'm like, oh, that's usually what I pick, especially with amoxicillin. And again, to echo what you're saying, I feel like that mirrors what I've seen clinically of reaching for amoxicillin versus clavamox. I think I've seen a really similar effect and I usually do it for about seven days. So that makes me happy to hear you say that. One quick question while I'm thinking of amoxicillin versus the clavulonic acid added in. When we're dosing that, especially if we're calling it in, you know, we might have our clavamox or or clavicillin or, you know, whatever sort of formulation, amoxiclav we have on our shelf and feel comfortable dosing that. But especially if we're calling in amoxicillin clavulonic acid, those ratios can be quite different. How do we choose our dose? Are we dosing this based off of the amoxicillin component? And does the ratio affect the efficacy of the antimicrobial in treating the UTI if we did feel like that was the correct medication for our patient? No. So you're going to dose it based on the amoxicillin component. The clavulonic acid component is not going to affect the efficacy. It's just with some of the human formulations, they can they can go up to a ratio of nine to one. And that you're going to see um, a lot more diarrhea in those cases. Clavamox was formulated with one of the goals of decreasing the amount of diarrhea we see in our, our, our patients. Okay. And that makes sense because I think that one is like a four to one ratio. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. So that's something I've always wanted clarification on. That's what I've always heard is dose it on the amoxicillin, but I'm so happy to get the opportunity to just ask you directly. So thank you. Yeah. You're nailing it across the board. Great job. Well, I'm hoping I can keep it up here where, <laughs> which honestly, like, like I said, UTIs, I think are a really difficult thing to treat. And one that makes me a little bit uneasy because I think we really run the risk of a lot of resistance in these cases. So In a lot of the continuing education that we've done here, UTIs have been a big interest point of mine. So I've been like trying to slowly tailor my my UTI treatment plan here. Well, when you talk about a resistance, I want to jump in there to something that I see a lot of our colleagues struggling with, a concept to wrap their head around. And it's when you've started an antibiotic and you're awaiting your CNS uh, results, Patient is improving on that drug, but you get your results back and it shows resistance to that drug. Carry on. Don't change a thing. If the patient is improving, the guidelines say carry on, even though your results say resistance. And that's really hard to wrap your head around, right? But patient's improving. So, so don't mess with anything that's working. Another thing that I say sometimes when I get asked to consult on a CNS is they'll show me data that's either all intermediate or all resistant. You're not, and this is not just for UTIs. This is for all infections. They're not seeing any, you know, susceptibility. Well, keep in mind that sometimes intermediate can flip to susceptible. So Use your professional judgment. If there's a drug on that list you've had a lot of success with, especially in these difficult cases, and it's intermediate, 
you can start it. If, if the pharmacology makes sense there behind it, you can start it and you may flip those bugs into susceptibility. So another little pearl for you guys. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that about the intermediate organisms. And I am going to say, you know, darn it on the resistance one, because I was doing so well. But yeah, that is my <laughs> gut instinct when I get that CNS back. And it says, you know, there's an organism that's resistant to the drug the animal is currently on. I usually do switch to the medication it says is susceptible. But you're saying if we're seeing clinical improvement, then go ahead and carry on with that drug. Are we still talking about that seven day time frame? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Day the course. And again, yeah, I know it's hard, but your patient is improving. That's what it comes down to. So carry on. Okay. I'm going to flip the script a little bit here. So we have our patient. Now I'm just getting into like all my burning questions of things that I've seen and how do I approach this? So we have a patient, let's say, and we run our CNS. It comes back and says the organism is resistant to the antibiotic the patient's currently on but we're seeing clinical improvement. So we carry on for that seven day course. The animal does great. We stop the antibiotics. Here we go. Then a week later, they're back with the same symptoms. Do we run another culture and susceptibility or do we go ahead and start them on the drug that was on this last culture and susceptibility? You know, again, that's, that's going to be prescriber preference. If it was me rather than running another one, just trying to save money for the client, I would probably use those recent results and what did show susceptible. I might give that a shot up to, up to personal preference at that point. I'm sure that all the by the book experts would say, get another culture and susceptibility, but my gut instinct says go with what you've seen these bugs are susceptible to. That makes sense. And I really appreciate a lot of what you're saying here of, you know, kind of trust your clinical knowledge. And, you know, this is a lot of moving parts and it's complicated. So there's not like a hard and fast answer of this is what you do every time. And if you do something different, you're wrong, you know, trust your clinical judgment there. Yeah, you know, there is there is absolutely something to be said for evidence-based medicine. I'm I am totally by the book evidence-based medicine when I can be, but you know, as you get out and practice over the years, you start to see what happens anecdotally. So it takes a mix to to really know what you're doing. You need years of experience as well. I really appreciate that, that messaging because, you know, antimicrobial stewardship, it is such a serious topic. So it's nice to see the whole picture being brought together here of the evidence-based medicine along with, you know, what works in real life. Right. Exactly. Exactly. We want to do the best we can, but at the end of the day, our duty is to our patients. So it's a tight rope to walk. It is. I agree. <laughs> Well, let's talk about another kind of situation that comes up frequently and one that I hope I'm doing the right thing on, but I'd love to hear your opinion on, and that's the asymptomatic patient. So if we, you know, what if we run a urinalysis on wellness blood work and it shows bacteria or pyuria or, or hematuria, but there's no other clinical signs, how would you recommend we approach those patients? Yeah, this one, this one's definitely tough and this one's definitely important for antimicrobial stewardship. And this is definitely where I'll pull out that, that antimicrobial stewardship soapbox. So if you have a patient that's asymptomatic, no matter what bugs you're seeing, it does not warrant starting an antibiotic. And it is kind of the same thing that I always get on my soapbox about not every kiddo that walks through the door needs metronidazole, especially cases of diarrhea. They will resolve on their own. The literature says so. But we walk that tight balance of, you know, client is there, has made the effort to come, is paying for the visit. Dang it, they want you to give them something. They want you to give them some something to take home, some antibiotic. In the cases of metronidazole, I know I'm totally tangenting, but this is always something that comes up with these discussions. You've got to weigh, you know, how small is that patient? How much of a risk are they at for dehydration? Does the client have white carpet all over the house? You know, if you're going to limit that, that case of diarrhea from seven days to, to two days, then do it. And, uh, 
We'll save that. We'll save that for another podcast. We need more podcasts. <laughs> That's an important on anti- one, <laughs> Yes, yes. We'll we'll pull out the literature on that one. But staying with this one, you know, I know it's tough. I know it's tough to not start an antibiotic there, but the guidelines really say don't do it. And if you really think about it, if you start an antibiotic when it's not warranted, might you be causing resistance to that antibiotic in that particular patient? Are you, with all good intentions, are you taking out something in your toolbox you could use later on? So as tough it is, as it is, nope, no antibiotic in those cases. Okay. So I'm happy to hear that because that is generally like, I is that the, the subclinical bacteria that um, the guidelines talk about? Yeah, so you absolutely need to use your professional judgment there. Could something else be going on, right? Could you have like a pyorrhea going on or something else that would warrant uh, using an antibiotic? If we do see a pyorrhea, you know, we have white white cells along with the bacteria, but still it, you know, no outward clinical signs. Does that kind of, does that change the recommendation? Yeah. In those cases, you, like I said, you really need to use your professional judgment as okay. to whether or not you want to start an antibiotic in those cases. That's fair. That's fair. And I will say like, since I stopped worrying about the bacteria alone, you know, not bringing in red blood cells, white blood cells into it and said, you know, okay, if this animal is not symptomatic, then we're not going to start an antibiotic. I feel like my stress levels went down because, you know, they teach us in vet school, treat your patient, don't treat the number. And so what I would always get afraid of is, well, okay, I'm going to start this antibiotic and then it's going to come back and there's going to be bacteria there again. And then what do I do? Am I going to recommend another antibiotic? Am I going to recommend more testing? And all of a sudden this owner is kind of going down this rabbit hole with me over their patient who is clinically completely fine. So when I set, you know, took the the weight off my shoulders there and said, if it's, if there's no other clinical signs and the rest of the urine looks fine, then we're just going to keep an eye on this. I, I feel like not having to have those conversations about let's do a bunch of treatment for your patient, for your pet, who's fine. It, it made my stress levels go down. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, AVMA has put out significant literature and helpful resources about starting a antimicrobial stewardship program in your clinic or in your hospital. And one of the things that it says is putting up some kind of messaging in your lobby at your front desk that talks about how you are stewards of preserving our antimicrobials for One Health. And, and you know, for all of us. And I think if you've set that stage early on, it does make it easier when you have to have those conversations with the client that says, you know, right now an antibiotic is not warranted. Sure. You've already set them up that you may not be walking out of here with something. Absolutely. Absolutely. And fortunately, I think that the message is also getting around in, in the human world to say, hey, this is a scary thing. We really need to make sure we're being careful. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And, you know, in all of the hospitals, you do see very complete, wonderfully thought out antimicrobial stewardship programs. And those are actually starting to happen in our space. Um, The Ohio State University, um, I just sat through a lecture where they've got a team there that is starting a tremendous antimicrobial stewardship program, um, or they're well on their way in it, actually. So, uh, we're catching up with what the human hospitals are doing with that. Absolutely. And I've heard about them at Colorado State and Auburn. And so I would agree with you. Right. So I have a question about another drug. We've talked about amoxicillin, amoxiclav, Bactrim, TMS. What about nitrofurantoin? Sometimes I get that back on my CNS and it's mentioned in the ISCADE guidelines, but it's just not a drug that I've used very often, not when I have a comfort level with. What what do I do with that drug? Yeah, it, it really is a good second line option for your cases that have multi-drug resistant pathogens. It's not one I would start out with, but it's definitely one to consider if your your other ones are, are not good options. In, in those cases, you would pull on it because it really concentrates in the urine, making it a great 
choice for UTIs. That said, the fact that it does concentrate um, to therapeutic levels in the urine, it wouldn't make it a good option for infections like our pyelonephritis. But for our simple UTIs, yep, most common adverse effects we see with that are gastrointestinal disturbances. And then the next question I always get is there's three different versions. What do I use? So um, when we're, we're talking about the commercial products. So the, one of the options is the commercial suspension. That's just pure nitrofurin towing. Um, what we see is that in humans, the data is still kind of a little all over the place with, with our patient base, but in humans, that one doesn't last as long, uh, shorter half-life. So maybe that's not the preferred one to go with. If you can go with one of the capsule formulations, so that would be your macrodantin or your macrobid, those are going to last the longest in the urine. And so we may be able to dose those less frequently. As far as the way you're going to dose those, in most of the drug reference handbooks that we see, they don't specify if that dosing is based on you know, the macro component of it. So go by that dosing and, you know, just see how your patient does with it. Again, uh, just to reiterate, you want to stick with the capsule formulations if possible. Okay. The capsule formulations and the total milligrams in that capsule is what we're basing our dose off of, not the nitrofurin towing component. Um, yeah, so the nitrofurantoin is, that is going to be the component that you're using okay. in your dosing. It's just the nitrofurantoin can either be in a macro crystalline formulation. Okay. Um, so we're getting down to like the really nerdy, like the chemist in me is jumping up and down right now <laughs> that you're asking these questions. I mean, I love pharmacology, so yeah, let's go. <laughs> I won't take it too far, but so you're either going to have when you're talking about the chemistry behind it, your three your three different ways your nitrofurantoin could come in. You've just got straight nitrofurantoin in the suspension. The macro dantin capsules, those are going to have a macro crystalline nitrofurantoin. And then your macro bid, that one is going to be a monohydrate macro crystal formulation. So right. it, it's, it's just difference in formulation. That's all it is. But your dosing is going to be the same no matter which formulation you're using. It's just what we've seen in, in studies is that, you know, suspension, pure nitrofurantoin does not last as long. You get a little bit slower absorption with the macro crystalline, so that macro dantin form. Okay. And then even slower absorption with the macro bid formulation. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Yep. No problem. And that's about as nerdy as I'm going to get. I'm not taking it any further on that one. Ah, oh, darn it. <laughs> I, so I will say like when we got started to get into some of it, organic chemistry and I were not the best of friends, but gen chem... I loved and, and pharmacology I loved. So there's like, I ha there's a little bit of a chemistry nerd here, but then like, I, as you start to get into like the monohydrates and the formulations and stuff, I went, that seems like it's getting dangerously close to yeah. organic chemistry for me. Yeah. Reel it back <laughs> in. Right. Yep. Yep. Uh, so last question here, just thinking along the lines of, you know, we're, let's say, you know, we're following the guidelines, we're doing everything we can to use our drugs correctly but we have this clinical patient and we're finding ourselves having to treat UTIs frequently. Apart from ruling out underlying conditions and doing all of the other things that good medicine would warrant, are there adjunctive therapies that, that you feel make sense for these patients, namely like supplements or anything along those lines? Have you seen any benefit to using those? Yeah, so from a prevention standpoint, what we've seen in human medicine, and again, I have no business talking about human medicine, uh, I do not live in that space, but what we have seen is actually with you know humans that have recurrent UTIs, what they'll try is it's kind of a, you know either a pulse therapy or they'll try just chronic low dose um, therapy as a pre prevention tactic. 
we haven't seen that that works in in our patient base. And then the other thing, which I hate to say because I've got I've got my buddies that put out fantastic supplements. I'm I'm a huge cheerleader of them, but these cranberry extract supplements and items like that, we have not seen evidence that they work in our patient base. Maybe some research will come out that shows that it does, but at this time we don't have have anything that supports that. Well, dog on it. <laughs> no pun intended. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, Dr. Young, this has been great. I really appreciate the conversation. Such an important topic, such a challenging condition to treat. So I really think our conversation has done a lot, at least for me, in helping to explain some of those guidelines and how to put them into practice in an effective way that isn't scary of like, am I doing this correctly? And you know, it seems very realistic, very doable. So I I appreciate the conversation. No problem. And, you know, I'll say again, anytime you want to come back and do another podcast, maybe like an antimicrobial boot camp, let's do it. We can tackle, you know, can I really dose amoxicillin twice a day? So stay tuned for getting nerdy on MICs and all of that. Good. Yes. I am super excited for upcoming antimicrobial boot camp episodes, like you mentioned, because yeah, inquiring minds want to know, can we dose amoxie twice a day? Yeah. Owner compliance here and all kinds of, like you said, moving parts with these things. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel just a little better about treating UTIs going forward. So I hope everybody else got as much out of it as I did. Dr. Young, thank you so much for joining me, and thank you to Blue Rabbit Ventures for making this episode possible. For more episodes like this, click on the Education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, It's a great day.